a joy always to be here in service with you in the Southern Asia Division. Pastor Lacra, thank you for your kind introduction. And on behalf of my husband and my colleagues, I want to extend to you and to your entire team expressions of our gratitude for your wonderful hospitality. You are the best. We appreciate you and all that you do for us, but just for being who you are. 
We thank you. And it is my distinct honor to bring to you greetings from your World Church headquarters, from President Ted Wilson there and those others of us who serve. Uh, those who know me know that I always say this when I go out. You, those of you sitting here in this congregation, you are the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Those of us who serve at the world headquarters are there to serve you. We thank you. We appreciate you. There is so much going on. I don't want to take too much time, but I must pause to say to those who have not been with us all week, that today's message really emerges from the experiences we have had over the past few days with the LEAD conference. We've tried to cover several, many different topics. We've looked at the knowledge base for leadership and delved into uh, skills that are necessary for leadership. And we talked about even the dispositions, God's call, everything. And today's message sort of brings this together but it does not leave anyone out. I'm looking at teaching, what Jesus taught us about teaching. You know, leaders must be mentors, must be teachers, but every one of us, if we are good Seventh-day Adventists, we are what? Teachers, because we've all been called to go out and do what? To teach. So I pray that we will all come together in this message. And uh, at this time, let us just pause to pray. Father God, again, we are so grateful that you are here with us, and we know that you have a message for us. Please speak through me, I pray. Holy Spirit, please fill this place and fill each one of us that we may receive what God is giving to us. Help me to be faithful to your word and to your message. I pray and I thank you in the worthy name of Jesus. Amen. True to our practice from the week, I will use PowerPoint that I don't always do uh, with a sermon, but this is sort of um, a different and mixed message. And if I can get things moving, we'll be fine. Often, often, you see this question, who are you? Lately on the airplanes, in the movie selection, you know, there are documentaries, and there's one, and I think this is the title, Who Are You? In this series, individuals, typically famous individuals, uh, search for their ethnic and national roots to discover who they are. But often, in many cultures, when someone asks you who you are, they're not thinking about who you are as a person. They really want to know, what do you do? Have you ever heard that? You've seen this happen? And so I wonder, how do you answer that question? Do you say, I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor, I'm a missionary, whatever? Hmm? It made me think about scripture and how Jesus is portrayed in the word of God. Jesus, you know, even asked, what do, what do people say? Who do they say that I am? And you know, we're talking about Jesus being the Messiah. However, Jesus was many things to many people. And just to explore a few, to the paraplegic at the pool of Bethesda, he was a physical therapist, according to John 5. To blind Bartimaeus, he was an ophthalmologist. To the woman with the issue of blood, he was a faith healer. For more than 5,000 hungry students sitting there at his feet, he was a miracle-working food distributor. For the rich young ruler, he was a psychoanalyst. For Zacchaeus, the tax collector, he was a life coach and occupational advisor. For the woman caught in adultery, he was a personal advocate and a public defense attorney. For the woman at the well, a social worker. For Nicodemus, an intellectual and philosophical guide. For the man who was blind from birth, a prophet. For the apostles, he was a breakfast cook an economic and civic advisor, an agricultural scientist, human resources specialist, a behavioral coach, a physicist, a fisherman. For multitudes, Jesus was a preacher. But I say to you this morning, 
more than anything else, all inclusive of all of these. Jesus was a teacher. And this is the title that is given to Jesus most often in scripture. And if we had time, we could go point by point by point to look at this. But I want to deal just briefly with the term that is used, that is translated teacher, didaskalos. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I am fascinated by words and how they're used, and particularly how they're used in scripture to convey the deep meaning of the message that God is trying to convey to us. If we look, if we look at this, of the 90 times Jesus was addressed directly in the gospel, 60 times he was called teacher. John reports that Jesus referred to himself as teacher, and that's important. Yes, we too are called to teach. Jesus has called each one of us, and you know this familiar passage, go you into all the world and what? Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But it emphasizes by coming back a second time and saying, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Yet, with all of this, we find that James, who is supposedly very committed, very much a supporter of Jesus and completely committed to the word, a sincere and true follower of Jesus. James says, I don't think you should get into that teaching thing. James says, I don't think you should be too quick to teach. Now, how can James caution us, even try to dissuade us from teaching when scripture is clear? You know what James said, we've heard it. Let's look at this again. My brethren, my people, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. And then I like the way the message version puts this. Eugene Peterson says, don't be in any rush to become a teacher, my friends. Teaching is highly responsible work. Teachers are held to the strictest standards, and none of us is perfectly qualified. Whoa! Now, teaching is my profession, and James has just told me that I am not qualified, at least not perfectly so. He says, we get it wrong nearly every time we open our mouths. If you could find someone whose speech was perfectly true, you'd have a perfect person in perfect control of life. Wow. Well, let's look back at the early church for a moment. You see, James is discouraging us, but he was there in the mix of things in the early church. He's dissuading, trying to dissuade those who were right there with him from becoming teachers. But yet we know when we study history, the teachers were prominent in the early church from the beginning. Matthew and John help us to see this, particularly Matthew, Mark, and Luke show us many things about teaching. And Paul, as we well know, when he issued the list of gifts, he listed teaching very highly on that list as given to us by the Holy Spirit. And Ephesians 4.11 says the Holy Spirit qualifies, but it does say some to be teachers. Hmm. We can trace this out a little more when we have time. Didaskalos means a teacher. Didaskalos in the New Testament is talking about someone who teaches concerning the things of God and the duties of humanity. It talks about one who is fitted, one who is fitted to teach according to Paul in both, well, I like to say Paul in Hebrews and definitely in Romans. The key then, I would probably take us to John chapter 10, those first three verses. Now, I'm connecting a lot without uh, sharing all of the details that go with that because of our time, kind of summarizing. But if I were to apply John 10 to James's stand, 
a sort of against teaching there in James chapter 3, I would say that James really is kind of echoing, mirroring what Jesus has already taught in that regard. You see, there is a contrast between the true and the false shepherd or leader or teacher. And this warning is against false teachers. Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up by some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. Now, in our commentaries, in several places, some have noted, when you really look at this passage of Scripture, look at what Jesus is saying, look at who Jesus was, the good shepherd leading the flock, look at how things were done historically. You know, the sheep were brought in at night into a fenced-in area or a sheep fold uh, with a fence or a, a wall around it. And the good shepherd, to protect his sheep, would put himself in that doorway, becoming the gate or the door. So Jesus is sort of the gatekeeper, commentary says, and the gate or the door itself. Anybody else would be a false teacher, a false shepherd, having to try to sneak in another way to climb in to get access to the sheep. Now, leaders, I hope you particularly hear this, but parents, I sure hope you see the significance for yourselves. We must do what Jesus did. Somehow, we must throw ourselves in between the ravaging wolves and our sheep that have been given to us for our care. Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same is a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To, keep, to him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. So we're looking at unfit teachers. Oh, I pray to God that not one of us, if examined this morning, would be deemed an unfit teacher. Back then, and I say today as well, many seek the status of teacher without the necessary moral, intellectual, and the call of God that qualify them. Unfit teachers were a major cause of trouble in the church back in the early days, perhaps even now. There were, the word says and history says, there were bitter partisan spirits in the churches because of these untrue, these false teachers who were teaching those things that were not true, that were not accurate. There was an unkind spirit. There was critical speech that was typical of the church community back then because of these false teachers. They were referred to by this term, pseudo didascoli. Jesus denounced the Pharisees, you know. These were the top teachers in the church. Jesus denounced them for teaching as doctrines the commandments of men and for not practicing the gospel. Paul and Peter warned against these pseudo teachers, these false teachers, that is the insincere, unprepared false teachers. He said, keep them away. Don't become one. Paul had a particular admonition, and in his last three letters, he one warned against false doctrine and urged commitment to the truth. He urged that we maintain the pattern of sound or correct, just, accurate teaching with faith and love in Jesus. He urged faithfulness to the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. 
That's what it's all about. That's what we're supposed to be doing, teaching for godliness. So teaching really is a great responsibility. Teachers are responsible for the spiritual welfare of those who have been brought to their, uh, into their spheres of influence to whom they should minister. So they must be scrutinized. We, we must be scrutinized by the Lord much more carefully than any others. God has given teachers and given us a great gift and entrusted us with the perpetuation of the faith. It's up to us. Jesus has done his part. He taught us. He modeled for us. No, it's up to us to keep it going. We must be faithful. He expects a careful account of this stewardship. The day will come when we have to give an account. Teaching is a higher calling. Paul, in reflecting Jesus' model, saw teaching as a lifestyle, not something that we do. It is the answer to who are you? Not what do you do, who are you? The New Testament calls teachers to increase responsibility and higher maturity. This week we talked about spiritual intelligence and growing, growing in spiritual maturity. I feel there is no higher calling. Hebrews 5 says, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you still need somebody to give you the basics. So he's kind of pressing right there. He's saying, you've been in this thing long enough. You should have grown. You should have advanced. You're supposed to be doing the teaching, not needing to be taught all the time. And on the other hand, you know that we never get past the need for being taught. For the aims of teaching aren't limited to intellectual knowledge, Bible knowledge, just knowing this word, even if we memorize it from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation, that means nothing. Just knowing it means nothing. It can never be the end in itself. The purpose is to produce love, faith, and godliness in our lives. It is to build us up into who we are. Colossians 1.28, Paul states the overall purpose of teaching. We proclaim him by instructing and teaching all people with all wisdom so that we may present every person mature in Christ. Disciples making disciples, some say sometimes. The core activity of teaching, we have a corporate responsibility along with our individual responsibilities and duties. And we have to hold each other accountable, brothers and sisters, when we get off track in our teaching. And sometimes, remember what Jesus said, teaching the doctrines, the traditions of men, sometimes even we, Seventh-day Adventists, are in danger of falling into that trap. We need to test everything all the time, no matter how long it's been around, no matter how long we've done this thing. And we have to be aware that God is constantly teaching us, bringing us something new. And we've been told that in these last days, we're going to get new, new light. Now, I'm not trying to say that I have a message for you this morning, so don't report that. I'm not saying that. But I know God is still speaking to us. The Holy Spirit is still talking to us. Maybe saying, well, the way you did this in 1844 may have been great back then, but not in 2017. I have a new thing to show you. You know, even in Isaiah says, you know, I'm giving you a new thing. Don't you see it? And so this is what he's saying about you should not still be sitting back drinking, sipping on milk. You should be eating strong meat and you should be the teachers. We should see the new thing that God is doing and be able to teach. This is why we must hold each other accountable. Teaching was central to Jesus' ministry. And you see all of these passages here that we won't stop. So it has to be central to our ministry as well. I looked at something 
because I am a teacher and I, I analyze what, what are we doing here, Adventists? We have sort of a, a dual role. And I found uh, some, I guess, encouraging words, quotations, actually, that I want to share with you. Um, one commentator said, teaching stands between the past with all it offers and the future with all its needs. How we talked about going into communities. We don't just go in there and say, we learned in 1905 that we need to give you this and that and that. No, we go in and listen to you and find out what you need. Some of this is what this is talking about, but it's much deeper than that. George Knight, whom you know, said the Christian church may be seen as both a conservative social force and an agent of social change. That's what we're about if we're true Seventh-day Adventists, true even to our heritage, because this is the way Seventh-day Adventists, the Seventh-day Adventist church developed. God gave us a message and we struggled to understand it all and sometimes we made mistakes and we went back and we let God teach us more and then when we got that God took us to the next higher level but we're always reaching and stress, stretching and striving to know more of God and more of his will for us. Conservative in the regard that there are certain pillars, certain principles that are unchanging principles, but an agent of social change, social indicating how we interact with each other and how we interact with the world. The way we did things back then was wonderful, but may not work up here in the 21st century. So we have to we have to, as teachers, as leaders, as parents, be ready to change the way we do things. Hmm. He said it is conservative in the sense that it seeks to transmit the unchanging truths of Christianity across time, but it is reforming, that is changing, transforming, in that it sees itself as the agent of a righteous God in a world of sin. He went on to say, teaching then, therefore, given all of this, teaching should be for transformation, for change. You can't grow without changing. We cannot become Christ-like without changing from our innate sinful humanity. Teaching then should be for transformation, for metamorphosis, for conversion and death and rebirth for individuals and then through these individuals for the societies in which we live. The measure of effective teaching can sometimes appear to be elusive because we want to put blinders on. But the measure of effective teaching is not about how much a person knows. You know, we get caught up in the great philo uh, philosophical teachers, the great historians, the great mathematicians and scientists. We get caught up sometimes in sitting at their feet and listening to them, but it's not about that. It really is not about that. It really is about who that teacher is and how that person lives in measuring up to God's standard. It is grounded in the love, faith, and godliness of the teacher's life. It links truth with life. The kind of teaching that has the outcomes of loving, trusting, godly men and women. This is what Jesus taught us about teaching. I want to take a moment as we kind of move right toward the end to look at Jesus' methods. I believe that Jesus' methods of teaching were a true expression of Jesus' character. And we don't see a one way or one size fits all. Jesus looked at us and understood each of us and adjusted himself, still true to principle, but adjusted his approach and his methods to meet our needs. 
Jesus' methods transcended time, culture, race, religion, and geography. It was a universally appealing kind of thing. It is and was boundless and dependable way of finding a path to the human heart. That was Jesus' goal, to teach us. He wanted to get to the heart, yes, the head, and we talk about the head, the hand, and the heart, but Jesus went right for the heart. Then he could get the head and the hand, right? God assigns this work, this greatest work of teaching to the family and to the redeemed community. I think that includes all of us and leaders particularly. Leadership then as didaskalos. We focused on this one term, but scripture uses many terms for teaching. And I just pull some from the New Testament Greek translation to instruct systematically, to train disciples, to train, to instruct, to correct, to counsel, to command, to order, and to hand down tradition. Let me give you an example. I think this is familiar to you. You know that passage in John chapter 4? Hmm, those first many voice verses? Yes? We call it the woman at the well story, don't we? We refer to this well as Jacob's well. Ellen White says in The Desire of Ages, on the way to Galilee, Jesus passed through Samaria. Now that in itself was unusual because Jews just didn't go through Samaria, right? They didn't, it, it wasn't that they didn't know the way. They would go out of their way to avoid going through Samaria. Most Jews, because there was hatred. I mean raw hatred between these two people groups, though they were somewhat related, right? But Jesus, and when you read this, remember the word says that Jesus had to go through there. Remember that? It's like he had an appointment. He had to go that way. He was compelled to go through Samaria. So on the way to Galilee, Jesus passed through Samaria. That's a whole preaching opportunity right there, Galilee to Samaria. It was noontime, the hottest time of the day, when he got to what Ellen White calls the beautiful Vale of Shechem. At the opening of this valley, was Jacob's well, she said. Jesus was tired, the word says, wearied with his journey, tired from the trip. Lord knows, I understand that. My husband and I had a terrible time trying to get here. It seems like United Airlines was dead set on keeping us from this assignment, and we were set on getting here, and the two clashed, and sometimes it looked like United was going to win. They held us up. They sent us everywhere. We were weary. So I know what that feels like. Jesus was weary with his journey. And so he came up to the well. He sat down to rest while his disciples went off to buy food. Now we call this the story of the woman at the well. This woman. You know, the Bible doesn't give us all the details, but somehow I can sometimes feel a certain kinship to her. Not that I've lived the life that she's lived, not that I've experienced the things that she's experienced, but she's a woman searching for something better, for a better way, really wanting to do better and wanting to go in the right direction, but she had lost hope. She, she just didn't know what else to do. You can see it in her eyes. There's no hope there. There's no challenge. There's no invitation to something better. So she thought when she did her daily duty of going to the well to draw water, that she would go at noontime. And you know why, right? At noontime, it's the hottest part of the day. The other women would not be there. She needed to avoid them, at least this time. She felt she just couldn't take it one more time. Their, their looks, the way they looked at her, looked down at her, their sneers, 
They're gossiping and whispering about her. She just couldn't take it another time. So she said, I'd rather face the hot blazing sun than to face my neighbors. So she made her way to the well at noontime. As she approached, she could not believe her eyes. There was a man at the well. Now men didn't draw water, the women had to draw water. That was their job. So what was he doing here? Who was he intruding into her plan? She could not believe it. And she thought to herself, how does this always happen to me? I always run into these men. I always get in trouble with men. What is this? She paused. She wanted to be sure that, yes, that is a man sitting there. For a moment, she thought, I'll turn back. What would the people think? They already think that I'm no good, I'm nobody, I'm nothing. What if they catch me, if they see me talking to this strange man here at the well all alone? I'll, I'll just go back, I'll just forget it. But then she thought, while I don't care how thirsty I am, that man of mine back at the house is not going to take kindly to my coming back without water. I have a choice. Maybe, maybe I'll just turn back and come later. But no, I don't want to run into these mean, evil, hurtful neighbors of mine. What shall I do, she thought. She pondered. She went back and forth. It was hopeless, just like her life. She decided she would go forward. So she went to the well, and there this man was. Perhaps I'll just pretend he's not there. Perhaps because he's a man, and from what I see, he's obviously a Jew. Perhaps in the custom of Jews, he won't even speak to me. I'll just get my jar of water and slip back to my house and it will be just fine. But when she got there, this man had the audacity to speak to her. What is this about? She didn't understand it at all. And then he asked her for a drink of water. She didn't know what this meant. She'd been approached by men many times in many places, in many ways. But he asked for the water. Well, maybe if I just draw this water and give it to him, he'll go away. But he kept pushing, and he engaged her in conversation. He talked about her past, oh, and her present situation that was not any better than her past. Jesus was challenging her, trying to stir something up in her, trying to break her out of that mold that she had settled into, that destructive, doomful mold that she had settled into. So she talked to him. She snapped back. Who are you? This, is, this well belongs to my people. Well, I don't know. And they, this is my, and they went back and forth a little bit. And then Jesus kind of gave her what she thought for a moment was a pickup line. He said, let me give you some water. And if you take the water I give you, you'll never thirst again. Now, back in Kentucky, that means more than water. And this woman was experienced in matters such as this. So she was sort of thinking, I knew it. I knew it. But then she listened. And he was different. He was not like men she had met before. He really wasn't trying to draw her off into inappropriate lifestyle. He wasn't trying to get anything from her, actually. And it almost sounded like he really, truly wanted to give her something that would help her. So she fell to his feet and she started listening. She knew about a Messiah that was to come, and really she knew, though she didn't like the Jews, she knew this Messiah would be Jewish. He, he sounded like a Messiah. 
He, I mean, he was speaking words of salvation, it sounded like. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. That sounds like hope. He's giving hope. He's drawing her in. He's telling her, you can break out of that lifestyle you're in. I don't care what you've done in the past. I'm looking to your future. You can break out of it if you'll just receive what I have to give you. She started to believe. Could it be? It, I, I, believe, I, believe it, I believe it can happen. Before long, she was overjoyed. This woman who was doomed, who had no hope, now was experiencing the joy of eternal salvation. So what next? True salvation, the true joy of salvation leads to teaching, doesn't it? Scripture says, overjoyed, she left her water jar and went back into the town to urge her neighbors, come, see a man. Look in that short time. She was able to turn from hopeless to hopeful, from hated and hating to loving and ready to go back and give all to those whom she didn't even want to see a moment ago. Oh, I can just imagine she was overflowing with this water that Jesus had just given her. And you know, in one of the commentaries, just an aside, one of the commentaries, it may be the Adventist, uh, the Andrew Study Bible, it says at this particular point, Jesus may not have been talking about himself as the water, but rather talking about the Word and the Holy Spirit. And this is what he gave her. And she went running, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? She didn't throw it at them. She didn't say, this is the Messiah. She said, come see for yourself. You may find that this is the Messiah. I can imagine just in between these verses that what she really said to them was something like the words of the Bill Gaither song. He touched me shackled by a heavy burden, neath a load of guilt and shame. Then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. Since I met this blessed Savior, I'm sure she said to them, since he cleansed and made me whole, I will never cease to praise him. I'll shout it while eternity rolls. He touched me, oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy, she said, that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me and made me whole. The word says then, these hateful neighbors, then they went out of the city and came to him. This was ministry and mission to the cities, wasn't it? She took that city for herself, for Jesus. So what does it all mean? What are the lessons learned here at the well for leadership ministry, that is for teaching and mentoring? John's focus is on the truth. I mentioned earlier that Matthew, Mark, and Luke kind of look more at the methods of Jesus' teaching, showing us what to do and how to do it. But John went right for truth. He focused on the content of Jesus' teaching. He says that this is the truth, is the revelation of the will and the character of God in the words and actions of Jesus in the ongoing ministry of the Holy Spirit. And I like what he says here. All other paths to truth are deficient or counterfeit, false teaching. Paul Hebert, in Transforming Worldviews, looked at how people change and he said this, and I found it true and really startling. People live not in the same world 
with different labels attached to it, different perceptions, but in radically different conceptual worlds. And we need to know this if we're going to teach. So what did Jesus do? First, he went in breaking down prejudices. Jesus overcame national prejudices, racial prejudices, ethnic prejudices, gender prejudices, social class prejudices, religious prejudices, and historical prejudices. Jesus understood readiness. That is a key, a foundation for teaching. You have to know when your students are ready to receive the teaching that you have to give. And there are things you can do to help them to be ready. We saw this in the story of Jesus and the woman at the well. Jesus provided a developmental context characterized by self-reflection. He talked to her about who she is, caused her to think about it. Open dialogue, he opened her up so that they were able to talk back and forth honestly. And then thoughtful analysis of alternative perspectives. She came to think life could be different if I accept what he's saying. Jesus guided the woman to discover her true self and potential. Leaders, that's why we've been called to leadership positions, not to puff ourselves up, not to lord anything or laud anything over anyone, but to build others up, to help them to discover who they truly are in Jesus and to discover their gifts, their potentials. Jesus taught her how to value herself, to value Christ and her call to recognize her call to discipleship. Jesus did this in four main stages, just very quickly. One, the awakening of a desire for something new in uh, verses 7 to 15. And in 16 to 20, the awakening of a conviction of personal need. We have to know that we need Jesus personally, not just that the world needs him. I need him. Number three. Verses 21 to 26, the call for a decision to acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah. And then those last verses, the stimulus to action appropriate to the decision. If there is no action, the lessons have not been learned. So we need grace, brothers and sisters, for teaching. When we accept what Jesus has done for us, we receive a holy competence for what he's calling us to do. You know, when God calls, he enables. That's all that's saying. Assured of his undying grace, we love those previously unlovable, intercede for those we used to think unworthy, and reach for goals we once believed impossible. Our steps are ordered by his love. Daniel Webster made this, my final true thought here, made this statement. And he's talking about something which time cannot efface. If we work on marble, it will perish. As beautiful as all of the marble is around here, it will perish. If we work on brass, time will efface it. If we rear temples, they will crumble to the dust. But if we work on a person's mind, if we imbue them with high principles, with just, a just fear of God and a love of their fellow human beings, we engrave on those tablets something which time cannot efface and which will brighten and brighten to all eternity. So I challenge you, I invite you to equip others, tell your story, model correct behaviors, and they will follow you also. May God bless you as you go forward.